Hi, my name is Scott Jarvie, and I am a postdoctoral research fellow, jointly hosted by the section of Eco-Informatics and Biodiversity and the Centre for Biodiversity Dynamics in a Changing World at the Department of Biology, Aarhus University, Denmark. Today, I am going to talk to you about the use of ecological niche models for restoration projects. I am honoured to contribute to this jointly taught open access online course, EMM 2020. Thank you, Town, for the invite. First, a little about me. I am originally from Aotearoa, New Zealand, which explains the accent. Prior to my postgraduate studies, I worked for New Zealand's Department of Conservation, often in remote and isolated places with pretty special species, such as the Antipodean wandering albatross seen here. For my PhD studies, I looked at the reintroduction biology of Tuatara, the only living member of Rhynchocephalia, the sister group to Squamata, lizards and stakes, which diverged about 250 million years ago. Among a number of approaches to address issues around the reintroduction biology of Tuatara, I used ecological niche models, both correlative and mechanistic in nature, to identify suitable habitat for Tuatara under current and future climates. For my current research, I use approaches from macroecology, including ecological niche models to inform trophic rewilding, the reintroduction of missing keystone species, such as large carnivores and large herbivores, to promote self-sustaining, biodiverse ecosystems. My research therefore lies at the interface between ecology and biological conservation, with the study of spatial biodiversity as the unifying theme. As we have heard during previous online tutorials and will probably hear in future tutorials, ecological niche models, also commonly known as species distribution models, depending on the perspective taken, are increasingly being used to gain ecological and evolutionary insights and to predict distributions across landscapes, possibly requiring extrapolation in space and time. For this presentation, I will use the terms ecological niche model or species distribution model interchangeably depending on what the original paper I cite refers to. Ecological niche models are currently one of the main tools used to derive spatially explicit predictions of environmental suitability for species. They typically achieve this through identification of statistical relationships between species observations and environmental descriptors such as shown in this recent study with the critically endangered central rock rat from Australia that included climatic variables and topographic features. However, more mechanistic modelling approaches, as well as approaches involving expert opinion, also exist. A wealth of papers and books discuss ecological niche modelling, including some shown on this slide. I will not go into much detail here as some of the material has been covered in the previous tutorials and more detailed information will come in future tutorials. I will, however, mention how many of these papers and books discuss how a range of approaches can be used to fit ecological niche models. How projecting these models to different areas or different time periods allows spatial and temporal extrapolation of species distributions from a discrete set of observations how theory and assumptions can influence the models and their sensitivity to a variety of factors. Depending on the species and the environmental data used to fit them, the algorithm used and the way that they are parameterized, these models can be closer to the actual or potential distribution, depending on the portion of the realized niche that is captured, whether model overfitting is minimized and whether proximal or distal predictors are used. As discussed in this influential paper in Ecology Letters from 2013, species distribution models are increasingly proposed to support conservation decision making. This is, in part, because many decisions about conservation actions are becoming more spatially explicit. In this figure from the same paper, we see the cumulative number of peer reviewed papers extracted from Web of Science from 1992 to 2011 related to species distribution models. 
The curve is drawn as proportions of the cumulative number of papers published in the category Ecology, with the cumulative number of papers for each year shown on the curve. This is from the same figure as on the previous slide, which is this time shown as the inset, with four important conservation domains of biological invasions, critical habitat, reserve selection and translocation combined together and shown as a cumulative curve in the main part of the figure. The solid line indicates papers without keyword decision, while the dashed line is with the keyword decision. The cumulative number of papers for each year is shown on the curve. Evidence of species distribution models supporting solutions for on-ground conservation problems is still scarce in the scientific le literature and by inference barely discussed for restoration projects. In this more recent review from last year in Science Advances on Standards for Distribution Models and Biodiversity Assessment, a similar trend is seen for the four important conservation domains. For this figure, we see the cumulative number of studies increasing for a random sample of 400 papers of the approximately 6,500 articles identified as mentioning statistical models of species distributions. The trend for restoration Defined here as the use of species distribution models to spatially identify areas that would be appropriate for restoration, or measures the eff efficacy of restoring specific areas, is very similar to that of translocation, and consequently barely visible. And what is the second panel of the figure seen on the previous slide? We see the purpose for which the species distribution used are classified. The first class is explanation defined as investigating a species' causal relationship with the environment. The second class is prediction, defined as mapping a species' potential distribution within the same time period and geographic region as the data used to construct the species' distribution model. And the third class is projection, defined as projecting species' distribution models into a different time period or location from the data used to construct the species' distribution model. Despite the rise in studies forecasting species distribution under climate change, explanation and prediction remain the most common uses. The use of species distribution models for restoration projects would typically fall under prediction and projection. Ecological niche models can contribute to the decision making process for restoration projects, a step really taken. One approach to do this is structured decision making which provides a rigorous framework for this process and is becoming increasingly used to address environmental problems. This approach is usually sequential, with potential roles for ecological niche models at most stages of the, the decision process, as shown in the figure and discussed over the following slides. For the first step of identifying a problem, ecological niche models can play a role, for example, by highlighting likely shifts of suitable habitat for a species and where restoration projects could be undertaken. For example, this study in ecology letters used species distribution models to assess the effectiveness of protected areas and the Natura 2000 network in Europe in conserving a large proportion of terrestrial vertebrates and flora. The model suggested that by 2080, about 58% of the species would lose suitable habitat in protected areas as shown by the dark blue in your left-hand column whereas losses affected about 63% of the species of European concern occurring in Natura 2000 areas, again with the dark blue but this time in the right-hand column. The authors concluded that the risk is high and that ongoing efforts to conserve Europe's biodiversity could be jeopardised by climate change, thus identifying a problem. Once a problem is identified, the second step would be to define the restoration objectives, which is usually as the realm of decision makers and stakeholders. Scientific input, however, may be used to make sure objectives are realistic, given the current or projected state of the environment. Although initial objectives may be set based on low quality data, through the course of subsequent conservation and research actions, better quality data may inform ecological niche models and lead to changes in the initial objectives. For example, in a recent paper in conservation in a review paper in animal conservation, the authors outline how species distribution models can be used to maximise the success of assisted migration. 
the intentional movement and release of an organism outside of its indigenous range to avoid extinction of populations of the focal species. In particular, they present guidelines as to which questions should be investigated when planning assisted migration and suggest methods for answering them. In a following paper in 2013, the authors use this methodological framework to show how to identify optimal conservation translocation sites, including for assisted migration under climate change for the hihi, an endangered bird from New Zealand. The figures show a, above show climatically suitable habitat in black and climatically suit, unsuitable in grey, with the white being entirely not suitable habitat. Evaluating the consequation of alternative actions is the fourth step, and ecological niche models can be used, for example, to predict resultant changes to species distributions or to the quality of habitat. For example, in this paper in PNA, species distribution models were used with a harmonised land use and climate projections to investigate their potential combined impacts on global vertebrate diversity under a low and high level emission scenario. This figure shows the spatial distribution and overlaps of threats from climate and land use change for 2080, assuming no dispersal. The individual colours indicate the different threats, where BC stands for bioenergy cropland, CC for climate change, CR for non-bioenergy cropland, and PA for pastures, and the overlap between each of the threats. The results are shown individually for the three taxa studied and the two emission scenarios. The maps show the distribution of the threats that are defined for each variable. The findings highlight the need to carefully consider both climate and land use change when projecting biodiversity impacts. The authors conclude that biodiversity is likely to suffer severely if bioenergy cropland expansion remains a major component of climate change mitigation strategies and call for a reduction in energy consumption for the benefit of biodiversity. Assessing the trade-off between benefits and cost of action is the fifth step. This important step builds on the identified consequences of actions. Ecological niche models can be used to quantify benefits to be traded off against cost of actions, such as understanding how land use and climate change may impact biodiversity. In a paper in the Proceedings of the Royal Society B from 2018, two different modelling par paradigms were used to investigate how land use and climate change, both separately and combined, could affect terrestrial vertebrate communities under different climate scenarios. In maps for only two of the climate scenarios, we see spatial patterns of biodiversity loss from climate and land use change by 2070. The areas with more than 10% net loss of species from climate change is shown in brown. Areas with more than 10% loss of species from land use change in blue. Areas with more than 10% loss from each pressure overlap is shown in black. And areas with less than 10% Losses from both pressures are shown in grey. The results have implications for the conservation of biodiversity, depending on the climate and land use change scenario, and for the ability of biodiversity to support important ecosystem functions upon which humans rely. Finally, the sixth stage, which is assessing and dealing with uncertainty. All conservation decisions are made in the presence of some uncertainty, and most involve the implicit or explicit specification of an acceptable level of risk. Assessment of risk includes estimation of the differential cost of biodiversity of areas associated with underprotection versus overprotection. In particular, the type and magnitude of uncertainty that are, are acceptable need to be based on the need of decision makers and incorporated into the decision of the objective. Ecological niche models enable the quantification of some types of uncertainty in the spatial predictions of environmental suitability, and these can be explicitly incorporated in conservation prioritization processes. For instance, in this paper in Biological Conservation from 2012, the author discusses the use of niche models with climate projections to inform conservation management decisions. In this figure, we see an adaptive management cycle highlighting two changes to incorporate planning and action in light of climate change. First, multiple possible future climate scenarios lead to a variety of possible futures that management must consider when developing adaptation action strategies. Second, monitoring actions under a changing climate is confounded with a changing climate such that success or failure must be accompanied by an 
attribution assessment that considered that past successful actions might fail under future conditions. Both of these two changes can be informed with the use of species distribution models, while acknowledging uncertainty from the use of such approaches. A similar framework to the structured decision making is provided in the paper I mentioned earlier from Science Advances for steps typically used for biodiversity assessment. I will not go into too much detail here, but note that such assessment process flows are typically implemented by international and national initiatives on biodiversity, such as by the International Science Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, or Climate, such as by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The authors recommend this addition, the addition of agreed upon and updated standards to ensure the adequacy of studies feeding into biodiversity assessments. The blue arrows and hollow boxes represent typically used current procedures, while the red arrows and green fill boxes represent additional steps needed to meet specific standards and guidelines. Despite the numerous potential conservation applications proposed for species distribution models, this paper shows only in a few occasions where species distribution models explicitly guided decisions related to the management of natural resources, and such examples are actually still quite difficult to find in the scientific literature. In the following three slides, I will discuss a few examples where this has occurred and species distribution models have been used to guide management decisions. Specifically, this will be for restoration projects that identified critical habitats, the selection of reserves, and for informing conservation translocations of threatened populations. Species distribution models have been used in restoration projects to identify critical habitats, which are typically defined as habitats necessary for the persistence or long-term recovery of threatened species, and their identification is required by law in some countries, such as Canada and Australia. Species distribution models are one tool for differentiating habitat quality at a range way scale, and can be combined with other sources of information, such as population dynamics, to define critical habitat. For example, in Canada, hybrid species distribution models were used to determine critical habitat for the Ord kangaroo rat. The map here shows the predicted long-term productivity of local or kangaroo rats populations in a subset of their range in Alberta, Canada, where source habitats appear in blue, while sink habitats appear in red. The figure on the right shows the cumulative risk of population decline to size thresholds of zeros, less than 25, and less than 50 female or kangaroo rats for the baseline landscape, as estimated with the hybrid species distribution models. An early example of the use of species distribution models in systematic conservation planning involves the development of species distribution models for over 2,300 species of plants and animals throughout the northwest forest of New South Wales, Australia, to delineate, to delineate and establish protected areas. This region was the focus of a long-running conflict between the needs of commercial forest harvesting and the protection of exceptional high biodiversity. The species distribution models were integrated with data on other conservation and timber values in an environmental decision support system by a team of negotiators representing all relevant government agencies and non-government. The aim was to identify areas of high conservation value for exclusion from logging, thereby resulting in major additions to the regional network of protected areas. The figure shows an Example application of the classification technique for deriving and mapping communities using canopy tree data and abiotic environmental layers. The survey sites were recursively partitioned into communities by identifying environmental splits that maximise the potential difference between groups in terms of compositional dissimilarity relative to the biological variation within groups. The environmental rules associated with the splits are then used to map the predicted distribution of each derived community. The active transport of species by humans has been proposed as a measure to mitigate the threat species face under present or future conditions. Species distribution models can potentially inform the translocation process at three key stages. First, 
Species distribution models can identify suitable habitat under current and future climates to reveal whether habitat suitability is likely to decline in regions currently occupied by the species, thereby supporting the decision of whether translocation is necessary. Second, if translocation is deemed necessary, species distribution models can identify potentially recipient sites, which may be climate refugia within the current range or sites that are projected to become newly suitable. Third, species distribution models can be used to identify which local species may be at risk of impact from the introduction of a translocation species through predicted overlapping distributions. An example of the identification of suitable translocation sites was the assisted migration of two butterfly species to sites about 36 kilometres and about 65 kilometres beyond their indigenous range in northern England. The map on the left shows the recent range expansion in the United Kingdom for two species at a 10 kilometre grid resolution, where hollow circles represent unoccupied grid squares. Black circles represent grid squares newly occupied from 1995 to 1999, and grey circles indicate grid squares occupied between 1970 and 1982. The sites of each interdiction are marked. The figure on the right shows changes in the estimated population index at the introduced site of Wingate, shown with the grey squares, and the four naturally colonised sites. All the plotted best fit lines are, are significant indicating the number of butterflies have increased in abundance over time at each of these sites since the translocation. When we are considering the use of the ecological niche models for guiding restoration projects, we are often discussing rare or threatened species. A common consideration is therefore that their ranges can be far from equilibrium under current environmental conditions, that is, the niche is truncated. For instance, low in, owing to local extinctions in otherwise suitable areas, Thus, modelled environmental suitability can also be truncated, leading to biased estimates from ecological niche models. A recent study examined the impact of such bias on estimated risk from climate change by comparing models of the distribution of North American mammals based on current ranges with ranges accounting for historical information. Here we see the species richness when modelled with contemporary records under climate change and the forecast of species richness for a 2070 future climate scenario using these records with the suitability decrease. Now, if modelled with historical records alone, the species richness increases, as does the increase in suitable habitat under 2070. If all records are included, the estimated future di diversity almost everywhere is drastically underestimated unless the full historical distribution of the species is included in the models. Consequently, forecasts of impacts on biodiversity un are unlikely to be reliable without addressing such biases. Such niche truncation has recently been termed the niche reduction hypothesis by authors in a paper in Transit and Ecology and Evolution, whereby heterogeneity and threat impacts across environmental space can result in reductions in the realised niche breadth of declining species. For the critically endangered central rock rat that was shown earlier, the authors of this recent paper in biological conservation used the lens provided by the niche reduction hypothesis to species distribution models by predicting the historic and current distributions of the central rock rat. The map on the left shows the study area in Australia, where red triangles are historic records from 1884 to 2002, and blue triangles are current records from 2010 to 2016. The habitat suitability maps confirm a dramatic range contraction for the species over the last 100 years. This is shown by the current predicted distribution for the central rock rat when modelled with the recent records. When incorporating historic records, the predicted suitability increases in the study area, including for a proposed translocation site away from the proposed threat that likely caused the range loss, that is, introduced cats. The authors conclude that the niche reduction hypothesis provided a useful framework for modelling the change in distributions of species, of declining species, in order to prioritise locations and interventions for management. 
When using ecological niche models for species with historic records, you should try to use environmental conditions that are similar to when they were recorded or deposited. The paper shown here in Global Ecology and Biogeography discuss such issues, while the other paper in Ecography details one freeware method that can be used to reconstruct paleoclimates for historic records. Niche truncation is a consideration for the use of species distribution models to forecast potential ranges of large carnivores and large herbivores, also known as megafauna, for trophic rewilding, a promising approach to resource self-sustaining biodiverse ecosystems. In a paper I published with Jens Christian Svenning in Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society B, we discussed such issues as niche truncation for megafauna, a strongly persecuted group of animals. This niche truncation is clearly shown when you compare estimated range maps of where a species would live without the influence of human pressures, such as for the African savannah elephant here shown in blue, with the current distribution of the species from the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, or IUCN, here shown in red. And this niche truncation is also true for a number of other mega herbivores. And also true for large herbivores, mega carnivores, and large carnivores. Now, if species distribution models are used with presence records generated from within the estimated range maps of the megafauna, without the influence of human pressures under current climates, we see the potential for range expansions for megafauna with warmer colours indicating more climatically suitable conditions. And in the future for the often described business as usual scenario, climate conditions will generally remain suitable for megafauna. Also, some species might experience reduced suitability in parts of these regions. This similarity in climatic suitability between current and future climates for megafauna can clearly be seen if we stack the climatic suitability maps for each of the species on top of each other to make a species richness map. We were therefore able to conclude in this study that climate change is not a major barrier to trophic rewilding as currently discussed in the literature. However, as most of us already know, a better future for wildlife on this human-dominated planet means we need to identify areas that will be shelters for species under changing environmental conditions, which is more than just climate change. So, in a recent study led by Sophie Montserrat and with Jens Christian, Svenning and myself, we introduced the Anthropocene Refugia concept that allows for the identification of areas that will remain climatically suitable for a given species in the long term, while also providing spatial and temporal protection from human activities. This concept intersects knowledge on species potential distribution, incorporating prehistoric and historic data with special, spatial information on current and future human activities. As a proof of concept for the Anthropocene Refugia, we then propose a methodology to effectively identify and map realised and potential current and future refugia using case studies from megafauna. For example, for Northern American bison, shown here, we overlaid a proposed threat index over the current range of the species that came from the IUCN as shown by the black polygon. And here we show the same threat index with the current potential range as shown from the estimated range of where bison will live without human pressures. We can also show the potential future range under climate change. This last panel shows the locations of realised and potential Anthropocene refugia. By applying a threshold on the threat index within the potential future range experienced by the species. The grey areas are predicted to be climatically suitable for the future but have a threat index above the reported threshold. We can also show the potential future range under climate change. 
This last panel shows the location of realized and potential Anthropocene refugia by applying a threshold on the threat index within the potential future range experienced by the species. The grey area are predicted to be climatically suitable for the future, but have a threat index above the reported threshold. These recently shown examples that ecological niche models can be used to guide different decision making steps in different conservation contexts, including for large scale restoration projects. Yet the bulk of ecological niche models currently remain primarily developed for scientific purposes. To bridge the gap between modelers and decision makers, the schematic on this slide from a paper in Ecology Letters shows a possible approach for improved communications with the use of translators. The proposed role of translators, which can be individuals, groups or institutions, can serve as a bridge between species distribution model development and conservation decision making, including for restoration projects. The authors know that Note that what they hope for, for from such an approach is wider recognition that species distribution models should be developed by experts with a clear knowledge of the decision making process in which they take part. To wrap up this talk on the use of ecological niche models and restoration projects, I have five take home messages. First, ecological niche models are increasingly proposed to support conservation decision making including restoration projects. However, evidence is still scarce in the scientific literature. Second, ecological niche models can contribute to the decision-making process for restoration projects. Third, ecological niche models can be used to inform both single species and large-scale restoration projects. Four, ecological niche models should take into account niche truncation. 5. Each ecological niche model should be developed for restoration projects by experts with a clear knowledge of the decision process in which they take part, after consultation with decision makers. To finish this talk, I would again like to thank you for the opportunity to contribute to this course, EMM 2020, with this tutorial on the use of ecological niche models for restoration projects.